Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails uh, Common Ground. I'm Malvika Jolly, Special Projects Associate here at the Rail, and today I'm thrilled to be welcoming Kevin Kaplicki and Sophie Glidden Lyon of Interference Archive, a volunteer run library and archive of social movements and political activism uh, located right here in Brooklyn. Uh, they're joined by the Rail's very own art books editor, Megan N. Liberty. And we're also so lucky to have the poet, Sherriot wish here with us today uh, who will be reading a poem inspired by a weekend spent perusing the archives to close us out in style so so excited to see that finally we've started out all of our events here with two important acknowledgements the first is that here in new york we're on lenapa hoking the unceded land and waters of the wabinger canarsie munsi and lenny lenape people of the delaware nation and the shinnecock indian nation the second is an acknowledgement that black lives matter and I think it's worth taking a moment to remember that the heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all those who struggle for freedom in recognition that when it comes to our liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation. That thought from the phenomenal Angela Davis. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions we've been putting together behind the scenes at the rail. I'll post that in just a second, uh, to which we'll add some materials from the Interference Archive probably. Uh, but now it's my honor to welcome our wonderful guest, uh, artist and farmer in the Hudson Valley of New York. Kevin Kaplicki is a printmaker, forager, salad monger, and autodidact with the help of friends. He is a founding member of Just Seeds Artist Cooperative, Visual Resistance Collective, NYC Ghost Bike Project, Miss Rockaway Armada, and the Interference Archive, of which, uh, you know, which is the topic of today's conversation. He's joined by his colleague and comrade, historian and archivist, Sophie Glidden Lyon. Uh, she's the volunteer coordinator for Interference Archive, where she's been since 2014. She holds an MA in Archives and Public History from NYU and has worked at the Maine Women Writers Collective, the Fales Library and Special Collections, and for the New York City Municipal Archives. She has a background in art archives and artist papers, and in her day job, she's the archivist at that uh, marvelous home for theater, La Mama Experimental Theater Club. Keeping them in conversation and in questions, we have arts writer, editor, and archivist Megan N. Liberty. She's the art books section editor at The Rail and co-founder of Book Art Review, and her writing appears regularly in such venues as Hyperallergic Art Review, uh, and has also been published in Art Forum, Art in America, Freeze, New York Review of Books Daily, LA Review of Books, and uh, certainly The Rail. She writes widely on artists' books and publishing and teaches archiving workshops for artists. And she's also uh, a 2019-2020 AICA USA and Creative Capital uh, participant. And she serves as the project editor of the Roy Lichtenstein catalog Raisonne. Uh, give it up for Megan Liberty um, and all of our cherished guests. And Megan, take it away. Wow, thank you so much, Malvika. You read my real whole bio there. That was so great. <laughs> um, I'm going to get us started by just sharing my screen. Uh, there we go. Uh, and so thanks for that introduction. As you said, I'm the art book section editor at the Brooklyn Rail, uh, and my interests really rely on artist books and artist publishing, ephemera, and archives. So I'm super excited to be talking about the Interference Archive with you guys today. Uh, I came to know about the Interference Archive through these interests when I was researching spaces or that were cataloging, collecting, and documenting artist publishing practices and activist publishing practices, and the way that printed matter is very much alive in these spaces. So that's how I discovered the Interference Archive, and I'm glad to uh, be chatting about it with you guys today. Before we get into the specifics of IA, I wanted to actually just ask the audience to uh, picture an archive. Uh, what does an archive look like in your mind? Um, does it look like this? Does it look like this? How about this? Or this? So as you guys may have guessed, all those images I just showed you are all for various images from Interference Archive over the years. And as we talk today about their history, their practice, and how they continue to keep the archive alive, I also want you to think about how they're both archiving interference as a space to keep that legacy, but also the ways in which they are interfering with our idea of what an archive is and what, a, what an archive is supposed to be. So I thought I'd start off by asking um, about the foundation of Interference Archive. It was founded in 2011 and it houses 
a huge range of different kinds of materials, including posters, books, um, magazine pages, all sorts of things. I'm showing you a quick example now of some. Kevin is one of the founders who we have here today. So I thought you could kind of expand on what your mission statement was. I'll read a little bit to explore the relationship between cultural production and social movements. And you do this in the archive space through exhibitions, open access archives, as well as audio archives and programming events. So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about the founding story of the archive and why you decided to collect interference materials in an archive itself. Well, hello everybody. Um... I am a farmer and I'm sitting in a little bit of a different kind of library right now. There's a bunch of seeds behind me and probably different from a lot of other people. I, I'm not super familiar with doing Zoom presentations, so bear with me. And I guess it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I'm more comfortable speaking in person. So this is a, this is a new experience for me. Um, so yes, Interference Archive was founded in a physical space in 2011. However, it, it became the, the project of collecting, you know, ephemera items and materials that, that we as, as cultural workers have made over time by Josh, and, Josh McPhee and Derek Greenwald. And I think, what actually stepping back a little bit more is is sort of the, the community and culture that that Josh, Dara, and myself kind of come out of is is the DIY punk scene. And, and the do-it-yourself hardcore and punk scene in the 90s was very much about creating your your own social spaces. And in those spaces at 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 musical events and shows, there they would likely be benefits for different kinds of campaigns, be it if it's animal rights, political prisoners, or or just any any kind of issue or campaign. So not only were they a space of of going to hear live music, but they were also a space where where political conversations and and political issues were discussed. And it was from that sort of collective spirit and that sort of self organization that inspires that inspired us to to want to create like a brick and mortar space like interference archive another another sort of activity that we all three of us kind of come out of is is like the anti-authoritarian anarchist tradition of creating info shops and bookstores and these these spaces would would be very similar to what interference archive is is, is in itself they would be places where that would have you know, boxes of old newspapers, of pamphlets, of political flyers and stuff. And also, so they would be places where the people staffing were generally involved in, in, in different political campaigns and social movements. So they, they became places that I actually got a lot of like my, my political education and, and my, my historical education on, on social movements of, of the sixties of like of the labor labor movements in the in the 19th century up to yeah the different like civil rights movements uh, black nationalism you know the gay and women's liberation and and uh, like another sort of another thing about me is that i i'm not a college graduate so these spaces became places where i where i i was able to to learn these histories but also learn how to apply them there were places where the, where meetings would happen for org, organizing protests and organizing campaigns, and it's very much in that spirit that that Josh, Dara, and I, and Molly Fair, one of the other co-founders, wanted to to create in, in with Interference Archive. So, because as cultural workers, we we were involved in a lot of different interventions, organizing protests and. And being involved in the punk scene, like there was a lot of printed material that 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 was being produced by by them, and we had, as paper being a bit of our fetish object, we had amassed a lot of a lot of books, a lot of flyers, a lot of posters. And Josh and Dara, having put together an exhibition called Signs of Change, which was held at Exit Art in um, 
oh dear, it escapes me, I think in 2009, um, it really became an opportunity to, they, they had realized that they had amassed this amount, massive amount of, of materials that it only made sense to make it public to people. Um, so yet in 2011, we had found a space in Gowanus and basically just started renting it as, as our own studios and as a place to build bookshelves and eventually mount exhibitions of, of pulling and curating materials from the collection. Um, Evan, if, I could, if I could just jump in before you get too far into that, I wanted to pick apart a couple of the things you, you just said. I'm curious about um, why you decided to call it an archive and what your conception of what an archival space was at that moment. Uh, because it could have also been a bookshop, but you, if you wanted to sell the materials, it could have been an exhibition space or a gallery. So I'm really curious about this notion of the archive in those early in those early years and the conception of founding. Well, yeah, definitely. As you know, being a part of the counterculture, I think like having having this this large large collection of materials. I think we we wanted it to consider an archive because it was it was all this historical material yet it was also but it was a lot of it was was very much living because it was contemporary but in in Dara and Josh's research for the signs of change ex, ex, exhibition they they came across a lot of institutions that were quite unwelcoming that you need to be accredited to go into that you know they weren't open to the public and it was quite off-putting to 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 be looking for materials that were produced by by your average person, not not like you know capital A artists or or cultural workers, but that that stuff that was made that that was that was intended to be out in the public, that was intended for protest purposes, it it just it it was a uh, it was an opportunity to to create a counter institution to mm. to a lot of the 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 archives that we were that that we we did see around us. If it, you know, I, I guess I. It, it's not helpful to list off names, but so, and we wanted it to be something more than just, than just the info shop, that the network of info shops that I mentioned from like the 1990s and early 2000s. It's, we were kind of a, a separate from that, but also, yeah. So it's like, we had this, this of an archive of materials and, and it just made sense to, to consider it in that format. But then in some ways to work against what uh, what our understanding of an archive is to make it fully open access. And again, for those of you in the audience that haven't visited, you don't need to have any special credentials or make an appointment. You can just show up and it's open shelves. And I think Sophie and I can talk a little bit more later on in this presentation about accessing and using the archive. But in a lot of ways that does interfere as you're saying with the expectations we have for an archive, maybe with a capital A, as part of an institution that requires certain gatekeeping. Yeah, precisely. It, and it's so in in a lot of again, I, I'm probably returned to the the example of info shops or radical bookstores, is that yeah, these spaces were available. You you could go in and just and pull things off the shelf. You could handle them. You you could read them. You could sometimes in some places. They would be lending libraries, so you might be able to borrow things. And that, if I didn't encounter those spaces, I definitely there's so much political activity that I never would have learned about because they, you know, the I never learned about the Weather Underground or the Black Panther Party in high school, and it wasn't necessarily going to be taught to me otherwise. But when I would in in these radical spaces, you were able to to just explore and access these things freely. So it's that spirit that we definitely wanted the interference archive to be. We didn't, we wanted people to be able to walk in the door and be able to open a drawer and handle something that's from 50 years ago that may have been used uh, as, you know, a, a placard or we pasted on a wall to announce a demonstration because these are our collective stories and it's not something that should be hidden away in a, in a basement somewhere. 
I'm just going to scroll to, uh, I made a sort of compilation slide that has sort of punk feminist imagery from your collection. And I know your first show uh, was drawing on, uh, it was called Grand Opening and Punk Feminisms in 2011. Uh, so what kind of was in this show and how did you conceive of this as your first show? So this is, was a bit of an homage to our, our, one, our founding member, Derek Greenwald. Um, who was an incredibly brilliant person, uh, amazing cultural worker and disruptor, and the, the one of the true foundations for Interference Archive. She was diagnosed with cancer in in 2011, and as as our you know our initial exhibition, we wanted it to be very much about her activities. So she was involved in the Riot Girl movement and and in music um independent music scenes and we uh so we we ended up pulling materials on on those themes of her activities as well as like the the broader communities activities from the 90s and 2000s so yeah there was a, a lot of a lot of materials from like lady fest a lot of riot girl zines and and just been very very focused on like the music culture because uh, that that was that was a big part of her her education as well. Awesome, yeah. And then as you were, I want to give Sophie an opportunity to add anything else that you might want to share from your, um, you joined the archive around 2014, you've said. Uh, and so you're more, as a trained archivist, you're more involved in the collecting policies and organization of materials and could maybe speak a little bit more towards how you guys continue to acquire materials, how you catalog mm -hmm. them. Kevin, feel free to jump in as well at any point in time. I want you both to feel welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, I joined. Uh, well, you know, joined is kind of the wrong word because the way that you can get involved at interference is, you know, there's no um, there's no leadership structure. Um, there's no um, sign up process. Uh, you know, we have we have ways to train people and to onboard them, but. Um, one of my favorite things about interference is that it really only asks for as much time as you feel prepared to give. Um, so I started dropping by <laughs> in 2014 um, and then got more involved in 2016. Um, I think the, um, the organizational structure of the archive is um, really focused on and devoted to browsing um, and wanting the collection to be as easily accessible to the person with the least amount of experience with an archive. Um, so with that in mind, the materials are organized by format rather than um, age or topic or who donated it or who created it. So typically in an archive, what happens is that anything that was donated together stays together. Anything that was created together stays together. It's the idea of maintaining a provenance and an original order, um, which definitely has its pros, um, but interference um, while still keeping track of who donated what and um, how the material itself came to us, we're more interested as Kevin was saying in getting these materials in the hands of people um, with as little barrier as possible. Um, so that means that you can walk in, take a box of zines off the shelf and just start flipping through it. Um, some of the format sections, um, just to give you a sense, it's things like um, 3D objects. So buttons, stickers, board games, t-shirts, um, Kevin donated a pair of uh, Zapatista boots a number of years ago. That's one of my favorite things in the in the collection. Um, then newspapers, posters, serials, zines, um, books, and um, a few of those sections are then organized by subject as well. So if you're somebody who has like a specific research topic in mind, you can kind of find that area of research within the archive with relative ease, but a lot of it is just alphabetical by title. Um, so 
knowing that it can be hard to find what you're looking for if everything is just alphabetical, we do have a catalog um, and there is a collective effort to um, build records in the catalog. Um, we started with the newspapers actually because we got a really incredible, huge donation of newspapers um, from a bookstore out West. Um, and so the idea was for the, for the areas of material that aren't organized by subject, we get them into the catalog, people can search them much more easily, people can do more intensive research if they'd like. But again, we wanted to maintain the accessibility of having someone who literally has no idea what an archive is, they've never been in one before, to just walk in and have the door be their entry point. They don't really have to think about it beyond just walking into the space. Um, and that's a really challenging thing to achieve. Um, you know, we're still working out kinks in terms of um, how to improve our access. Uh, access is a word that archivists throw around a lot. Um, it means many, many different things. And one of those things is um, the way I think of it is a sense of entitlement to the material. Um, you know, as Kevin was saying, again, this is material that was created by average people. It, and it was created for purposes that I think um, means that that material belongs to people. It belongs to the people. Um, and we really want people to, when they come into the space, to feel as though this is their material as much as it is anyone else's. Um, that this was material created for, um, for a very particular purpose. And that purpose was, you know, whatever the movement was, we have a really broad range of movements, um, international movements, domestic, really across the board. And um, it, it makes so much sense to me that we would have this material that was created in service of liberating people be as free to use as, as we can make it. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the philosophy behind the organizational structure of the archive. Yeah. I love um, that. I just wanted to unpack, just slow you down a little bit. And just, I love that notion of access that you've mentioned and kind of how complicated that is and what, how to create a space that makes people feel welcome, all kinds of people, and how mm -hmm. to create a space that makes people feel ownership over these materials is such a wonderful way of phrasing it and such a difficult way of trying to build uh, an archive, uh, mm -hmm. trying to build a space because archives necessarily uh, must also preserve in a way. And so I, that also brings me to one of my favorite points about the archive, part of your collecting principles um, require the materials to be able to be handled. Uh, and I think that's especially interesting when we consider it in an archive space or another kind of uh, space devoted to preservation of materials. And this is, I I'm really curious how you manage this. Uh, mm -hmm. When you're receiving materials for donation, how do you assess whether they really can be handled, what some of that criteria is, and then how you manage it in the space. So when people walk in off the street, um, what is that process like for them to just pull something off the shelf and then flip through it? Especially you're mentioning newspapers are extremely fragile. Uh, they yellow over time, the oils on our hands damage them. How, how are you managing all these, these aspects of keeping the materials for use? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, trying to figure out where to start. Um, so when we, I, I will say that we aren't really doing active collecting. Um, we've never really done active collecting. There was sort of the core collection that Kevin and Josh and Dara and Molly came in with. Um, but then uh, over the years, it's really just been a matter of by word of mouth, by the, the networks that the co-founders were kind of plugged into, interference became a place where folks who were involved in these movements who, you know, in many cases really didn't want to give their material to a big institution um, could come to us instead. We were the alternative. And so we've been able to rely on people coming to us with um, some really incredible 
uh, collections of material. So that's that's how we that's how we've grown the collection. Um, the criteria for accepting material into the archive it's pretty broad. Um, we kind of have a few different tiers. So the first is it has to relate in some fashion to a social movement of some kind somewhere on planet Earth. <laughs> That's the biggest kind of umbrella. Underneath that, there are things like, okay, well, do we already have a copy of it? Yes, then we don't, we're not going to accept many duplicates. Um, it does need to be um, something that was created in use typically something created in duplicate with the intention of distribution. So we're not collecting personal papers, correspondence, um, photograph collections. We're not collecting organizational records necessarily. Um, it needs to be the, um, the, the, material that activists make in the course of their work that they are using to educate, to advertise, to- so Something that's sort of more public facing. Yeah, yeah, all that public facing stuff. Um, and then the last tier underneath that is uh, a question of restrictions and, um, and, and uh, the state of the material. So if it's in really bad shape, we can't accept it because we need to be able to let people use it. And we also don't, typically don't have the funds to do conservation work in a real way. We can do little bits and pieces, but um, as far as in the space, sort of your real question about how do, you, how do you preserve these materials while still letting people use them as freely as we do? You know, I've found, um, I've worked in very formal reading rooms and I've been volunteering as a staffer at Interference for a long time now. And um, I have only maybe once or twice since I began staffing at Interference, have I ever had to ask anyone to be more gentle with the material. Um, I think there is a conception both within my profession and externally that um, if you don't enforce the rules, people won't respect the material. Mm. And I have, I, I no longer believe that, you know, um, the amount of reverence with which people touch this stuff in the archive at Interference is actually kind of moving. <laughs> um, I, I love that. And thinking about the ways in which these institutions often um, use that as a justification for gatekeeping, it's yes. so interesting to then hear you say, actually, you don't need to have an education on what an archive is, what fragile newspaper material is, you know, how to properly handle a, a fragile mm -hmm. magazine or book to understand how to treat these materials with the respect they deserve. Yeah, and obviously there are exceptions to that rule. Yeah. But, seems, um, if no, I, I could jump in. in. Wants to jump in as well, yeah. Um, I, I think, so one of our other principles is that the use of the material is its preservation. Yeah. So people accessing this, this material will hopefully inspire them to go and create you know, could go fight for social justice to create more, like cult be cultural producers and make more of this stuff. Um, and I think the, we've had, we've had materials that have come in that have been, you know, books that have been quite rare or, or quite valuable. We have a, a I mean, we have a large collection of Ospol posters, which are, uh, produced in, in Cuba, but for the organization in solidarity with the people of Africa, Asia, and Latin America that have made, made, been made from the 60s. Like some of them are hand, like screen printed and, you know, we, we treat them as, as best as possible. However, we want people to be able to, to flip through them and, and gain design inspiration and gain knowledge of, of the various like struggles for national liberation over time. It's another, well, a particular example is there's a, a May 68 uh, poster book of the Atelier Popular that, that we had. And I think somebody, somebody had come in and was like browsing through it and the spine split. And the beauty of, of Interference Archive and of collecting multiples is that a couple of weeks later, somebody donated that same book in better in better condition. So now we have we have two copies: one that people can can browse through, and like, and if it gets a little bit rough handled, that's that's not a, as big of a deal. But 
we've we've found that that sometimes there's when when you treat things like too preciously mm. people aren't going to be able to to access it but when you realize that there's that there's there's like a, a kind of a, a beauty in the in the world that of, of how <laughs> things work out that uh that yeah that a replacement may come along yeah and this idea of use as preservation uh, is very well said, Kevin. I, I really like that. Thinking about the archive as a space to preserve, we often think it means making sure the materials themselves survive in perpetuity, but actually, especially with an archive like Interference Archive, what needs to be preserved is the spirit and the energy and the ideas behind the work. And in order for that to happen, it has to remain active and alive and accessible in the ways that you're describing. Precisely. It's it's the concepts and ideas that 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 inspire people to make the items that that are something that we want to expand upon and 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 just re and yeah and yeah recycle and yeah. Uh, and just to uh, oh did you want to add something else, Sophie? Oh, I was just thinking about you know how um, you know part of what makes archives so powerful. Um, in, in many nefarious ways often is the fetishizing of the objects themselves and how, because they're in the archive, they're imbued with this authority mm. that um, makes them unquestionable and interference trying to push back on that with this focus on the knowledge held within the documents rather than the documents themselves. And that if we prioritize that knowledge over the, the physical material then we're kind of counteracting a little bit of that um, that uh, fetishizing and and the danger th that um, you know <laughs> yeah I, I'll I'll leave it off there but <laughs> yeah no of course and I think one thing that I hope we'll keep coming back to throughout this this conversation that underlies the interference archive and many of the kind of urgent questions around publishing and archives today in this moment are the ways in which archives and institutions reinforce history in a very specific way. And how mm -hmm. right now we're uh, productively destabilizing that history and how can the archive be a way in which we productively destabilize and rethink the histories that institutions traditionally keep for us. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm transitioning a little bit into the exhibitions you guys have done here. I've just picked a few posters off your website to show some of the range. And I'm just gonna read a list. You both have touched on the, the variety uh, and huge diversity and astounding span of the types of materials and exhibitions you've um, covered. But some of the causes and movements that your exhibitions have covered include food justice, climate change, LGBT, LGBTQ rights, civil rights movement historically, and the current uh, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, women's equality movements historically and now, um, sexual violence awareness, uh, broad spectrum immigration issues, as well as housing justice. And this is just a very small, very small uh, list uh, of some of the, the causes that you guys um, are keeping track of through the archive and through your exhibitions. And so, I think exhibitions are another way that you keep the archive alive and active and inviting and welcome the public in, in a way that people are comfortable with and understand, and then hopefully encourage them to browse the archive further. Uh, so I've just pulled out a few exhibitions off your website that were interesting to me based on my personal interests and the availability of images I could find. So I thought we could kind of go through them and talk about some of these topics uh, and kind of talk about your exhibition programming and how that comes about. Uh, the first one, uh, for those of you who read the art book section at the Brooklyn Rail know that I cover um, comics as well and graphic novels as, as materials under the umbrella of art books. So I was really excited to see that you did an exhibition of uh, our comics ourselves identity, expression, and representation in comic art. And this was in 2016, I believe. And so I think comics are so interesting as a revolutionary material, but they're not always thought of in the sense of protest materials and social justice materials when they are this kind of mass culture way in which artists and writers can directly communicate with the masses and the people uh, and can really demonstrate subtle shifts in, in these things. So I don't know if either of you had anything you wanted to share about this exhibition in particular or your collection of comics uh, or your exhibition programming. 
Kevin, were you were you involved in this one at all? I I was not. Yeah, uh, but I maybe to give a little bit of background of of just how the archive is structured that that we are an all volunteer run organization. It's it's a horizontally organized uh, institution or and and project where of we've had hundreds of volunteers come and go over over the years where um and and many of, of, of the exhibitions will generally be be like the brainchild of one person but it it, it will become a, an organizing and, and curating body of, of multiple people um monica johnson josh's partner was one of the people that that helped facilitate this exhibition Oh no, we're losing Ooh. Kevin momentarily. Um, hopefully he'll pop back in. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add about this exhibition or, oh. And we, we've seen people that, that are coming into the space. Oops. Kevin, we actually lost you momentarily. Do you mind um, going back like two Oops. lines? Right where you were, you were talking about Josh's partner who uh, had a hand in this exhibition. Thank you. My, here, let me see if this will go back on, apologize. Okay. Um, but no yeah, Monica Johnson was the, was the one that, um, that sort of initiated this exhibition and helped, help coordinate it. And just that there, there have been numerous people that have come to the archive, gotten involved in, in researching and, and creating the exhibition. So the programming is, is very much similar to the structure of how we run the, the archive and how we make it available to people and also it's exemplary of like the social movements a lot of the social movements that we are collecting from is that we are an anti-authoritarian like horizontal collective so yeah, yeah it's it's a variety of people that that have have contributed that's awesome I, another exhibition i pulled just out of my own uh interest at the intersection of archives material culture and uh art books this exhibition, Designing Black Power, that was actually in Little Cases at the Ace Hotel in 2015. Uh, and I was really drawn to this because book design is something that I'm really interested in and thinking about the ways in which um, subtle messaging is conveyed to us through book covers. Uh, a lot of artists have done projects on this, including an artist I used to work for, Glenn Ligon, made a, a book that was kind of like a memoir through book covers that shaped his formation of his identity as a growing up. Uh, and so I think that book covers are extremely powerful and often uh, we don't think about the ways in which the design of these covers indicates certain things to us, is messaging certain things to us. So I thought this exhibition was really interesting. I don't know if either of you were at all involved. I, based on my research, it looks like Josh organized this exhibition. Yeah, and, this seems like Josh's <laughs> touch for sure. Yeah, we seem to have lost Kevin again, so I'm just gonna keep moving on, but these are some examples of book covers that I pulled. Um, I am here, I just, I just out of, but I oh. just want to make sure that my, my connection stays good. So I'll, Great. I'll listen yeah. and Did try you want to speak. add anything uh, about this exhibition or uh, book cover design and design exhibitions? Well, yeah, Josh, Josh is a, is a graphic designer and a book cover designer himself. So this was very much a product of his, his labor, but this was an example of an opportunity of, of doing um, programming outside of our own physical space. So yeah. I'm really glad you brought that up because some of your exhibitions have traveled to other art spaces as well, um, university galleries, but this is in the lobby of the Ace Hotel, which I think I love the idea of just kind of putting a subversive interference archive exhibition in like a fancy hotel in Manhattan and just seeing who who gets interested in this and then who wants to check out the archive, who, who you can um, who you can inspire through uh, art in unexpected places. Yeah, I think actually that's a um, makes me think about one of the aspects about the way we do exhibitions that I really appreciate is, um, you know, they can be internally motivated, it can be a, a volunteer who has an idea poses it to the group and if they have enough people to help them make it happen, it, we make it happen. Um, but then we also often will have, especially, you know, a few years into the project, have had people come to us 
and um, ask to partner with Interference um, to put on an exhibit that maybe uh, focuses on an era or, um, or on material that Interference might not have as much. And so we can kind of join forces and, and make an exhibit happen that then not only broadens our audience, broadens our connections, but keeps us, the, the people who are approaching us to do those kinds of shows tend to be you know, present day contemporary organizers. So mm -hmm. it keeps us plugged into the people who are doing work on the ground right now. I think um, it's really important when we're talking about interference to talk about how we um, are very much interested in, in being, um, you know, a, a source of history and being able to look back, but also making sure that that's all staying very connected to what's happening on the ground right now. Um, and that these are not movements that are done or over or complete. Yeah, I'm gonna lead us towards some more contemporary exhibitions and archiving uh, examples of your, your cataloging. But um, I also wanted to quickly ask through those partnerships, do you end up making any new, adding anything to your collection from those? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's often great. we'll have people either donate some of the work that they loan for the exhibition or or new material will be generated um, through the programming that we're doing. There's a whole bunch of ways that that can happen. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, OK, so uh, another exhibition uh, building for us stories of homesteading and cooperative housing. And I, I wanted to talk about this exhibition a little bit because I was really interested to see how much programming went along with this really mm. educational programming, multilingual programming um, to give people information about not only the history of housing, housing inequality and the ways in which um, government sponsoring housing has been abused over time, but also to give people tools for current housing activism uh, and for the movement that's ongoing. As you said, these none of these movements are really over um, for housing equality uh, in New York, but more broadly. Yeah, this was a really powerful exhibit um, in part because of the programming, the amount of time and energy they devoted to programming. Um, it was uh, a partnership with UHAB, which um, I'm not gonna be able to remember what the acronym stands for right now, urban housing, something, something. It's a little embarrassing. I wasn't involved with the actual um, production of this exhibit, but um, one thing I can say that was particularly powerful was they um, put a lot of energy into connecting the historical movement, as you were saying, with the ongoing movement. Um, it focused a lot on um, the urban squatting movement that began in the 70s and that for a number of um, communities turned into co-ops, um, into city recognized co-ops and uh, just like the amount of work that that took and what that meant for the movement. But what was incredible, you can kind of see in the left-hand picture, there are all these Polaroids on the wall um, and those are, uh, archival photos of the buildings in question. And there were a couple of occasions where we actually had members of the co-ops and members of this movement who weren't involved in the exhibit, but came to see it at the opening and later on and were able to recognize themselves and other people in the photos that were on the wall. And that was just absolutely one of those moments that you love the archive for um to being able to make the connections like that and to bring them into our space and to connect them with you know, younger people who are very interested in continuing their work. Um, it, yeah, this was a really great exhibit. And uh, it's also a reminder of the archive as uh, a space populated by people and personal stories and personal narratives. These aren't stagnant objects that are past. These are, these are real connections that are personal and represent people in a lot of ways. I also, um, I didn't, we're not gonna probably get too much time to talk about the podcast, but if people are interested in uh, these narratives about uh, housing there and squatters rights in particular, I listened on your website to the podcast you, you did on interviewing people about that. So if anybody wants to check that out, I'm sure someone on the rail team can drop a link to the podcast series. They're, they're great. Um, and also plays into this idea of the audio archive as well as a printed materials archive. Uh, and then 
Another example uh, that I thought was interesting of just thinking about taking the archive out of the physical space and keeping it an active, engaged participant in social justice movements and resistance. Uh, this book block from 2013 was uh, shields that were made from, with CUNY and Cooper Union of books that were used during protests. Uh, and I thought that was just a really powerful uh, way to take materials from the archive and bring them into the space of political action outside of the, the archival space. Yeah, that's uh, amazing. This one. Oh yeah. Uh, no, and about this one, it's like the, the wanting to create, like make the archive a space of, of not just education and access to the materials, but actual action and cultural production. So we actually did a, a workshop where in the parking lot of, of our old space where we actually made these book shields and they were intended to be used during uh, the, some student protests at Cooper, but they unfortunately were confiscated. Oh, wow. Yeah, I hadn't even heard about this one. So this goes to tell you how, um, you know, you can really have your own little corner uh, at interference, but um, it does remind me also of, um, Interference likes to do propaganda parties um, where we'll often have people who are organizing some kind of action or there's, you know, if May Day is coming up or something like that, um, we will uh, have parties where people can come and screen print posters, t-shirts, they can make buttons um, and we try and help provide the actual organizing material that they'll then take out and use um, in their work. We had a particularly big one in 2016 um, in advance of the inauguration um, that just really packed the space. It was kind of crazy to see, but that's definitely a big part of, of the mission of the archive is to make sure that this stuff stays in circulation basically. Yeah, and I think that also goes to help interfere with the notion of uh, the archive as a space where materials stay and remain closed off, but rather an archive that invites not only viewers in, but materials out uh, is really important for the kind of materials that you're storing in this space and for maintaining their legacy, as Kevin was talking about earlier, as really being tied to cultural work and social movements. Uh, I have so many more, I don't know. <laughs> We want to use some of these to transition to some of the other topics, but I actually, this was great because I actually was able to get a lot of images from the catalog from this. So this, we, we are all in this together from 2017. And I think this is just a great opportunity to again, show some of the range of materials and topics covered. Uh, I'll just scroll through a few of them uh, and feel free to jump in with any notes, but the design of this catalog is really beautiful in addition to uh, really clearly showing some of the range of materials that are in the archive and ways that the archive represents a lot of different movements as we've been talking about overall. Uh, and this was uh, 2017, it's fairly recent sort of, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. This, so, and this actually, so this is sort of parallel to, to Josh and, and my activity as, as collecting materials of historical movements. We are also, you know, graphic makers and and um, printmakers as, as part of a, the Just Seeds Artist Cooperative. And so Just Seeds is, a mem is now a cooperative, a producer's cooperative of uh, 41 members around around the continent. And it's it's a group of, you know, social justice artists that, that are constantly making work in, in the service of, so, of social movements and we have we have a collection of of the artist materials in, in in interference archive and so it was probably around like eight or nine years of our activity together that um we were we were invited by the by the dolly moss moss gallery at suny purchase to do to do an exhibition and so we kind of did a we use it to do a survey of the materials from Just Seeds that we had in the show and kind of broke it down by different 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 movements that that the members have created work for and we we was uh, so we had the exhibition up at, at SUNY Purchase they they were able to produce a catalog which is really fantastic because it's kind of the the biggest survey of, of Just Seeds work that we have published 
And it was really sweet because we got to do work with uh, the student designers to, who actually made the, who created the, the graphic design of the book. Yeah, I really, I, I loved the design. So I, I had to just limit <laughs> myself to just a few spreads that I found images of online, but they were all really expertly designed and captured a lot of range of really graphically powerful materials uh, and a range of the causes represented as well. Did you want to add anything, Sophie? No, no. Yeah, and I think also the publications, I, you haven't produced too many publications that coincide with your exhibitions, but that's another way, another layer of thinking about history, archives, and circulation outside of the space that's really important uh, and exciting to think about. And then I just have a few more. Uh, this exhibition, Black Women, Black Lives from 2017, also, I think these images are from the Gun Gallery. So this was one that potentially did not take place, it was a traveling exhibition of materials from um, Interference Archive. And I, I think that I'm really interested in everyday in a vernacular and printed matter then being placed in the space of the exhibition, how that changes our relationship to it and the stories that they tell in these contexts, elevating these stories. Yeah, it's funny, I, just even just looking at this photo, <laughs> um, one of my favorite things about doing shows at interference in the in the actual space at interference is because we are then allowed to mm. have we have little vitrines now built into our space, which is really fantastic, but they're vitrines that um, you can open <laughs> and um, we tend to, you know, we ask people, we don't want people to take things off the walls, but um, but it is immediately, you can feel this um, distance between you and this material that you're looking at. You're looking at all the covers of these beautiful pamphlets and newspapers, but you can't read what's inside them. Mm -hmm. And you're dependent on the curator to contextualize them for you, um, to read the text that they've put together. And this is, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily uh, someone who's gonna go on like polemics against galleries or, or um, curation necessarily, but um, it is just such a stark contrast to me. Yeah, I mean, the, the issues you're bringing up are really important in thinking about exhibitions of archival material. They're issues that I think about often in my writing about artist books and artist publications, um, how they can be displayed in a way in which these objects that are meant for use, these artworks that are meant for use can be used. Mm -hmm. um, you do such a great job of that in the interference archive space. And it's interesting to see what happens to these materials when they're in a different space. On the one hand, I think it's really powerful to see these materials in a gallery vitrine and to have them elevated to that status of uh, almost artwork, but also have that kind of authority in this exhibition space, but also at what cost, you know, then they can't mm -hmm. be, they can't be touched and you're dependent on the narrative that is built around them in the context of the exhibition. So uh, it's a two way street that I think is, it's really important to uh, highlight that for our audience and think through the implications of that. This is just another uh, image from that same exhibition to show a few more of the materials. And then the last exhibition I wanted to talk about is kind of using it as a transition to think more broadly about a lot of the topics we've already touched on, but you know, who gets to be in the archive? We've talked a lot already about access, but the kinds of materials that are in the archive, uh, Kevin has really given us a great uh, sense of the spirit of it, but really thinking through who gets to see themselves in the space of the archive, what it means to be archived, what it means both as a way to become part of history, but also what we're talking about, kind of the limitations of once the material enters the archive, what narratives it can no longer be a part of. Um, it's not being used in the street anymore. It's in a different kind of context and a different kind of space. So this exhibition, I just really was drawn to this title, the exhibition online. It says it's called, um, We Are What We Archive. And then here, this poster, We Are Who We Archive. So, and this was from 2017 also. So I, I just thought, and there were a number of programs that went along with this uh, exhibition that highlighted different ways of rethinking who and what an archive is, which is something I'm really interested in and, and think quite often about. Uh, and I think it's really perfect for the context of Interference Archive. Yeah, this was an opportunity for volunteers um, to 
sort of focus on the the um, subjects and movements that they themselves were particularly interested in or involved in and do these sort of smaller mini exhibits that, um, as you're saying, tried to give a sense of the scope of the collection. Um, I mean, I think it was a really great way to involve a broader swath of volunteers, just like with all questions of access, sort of folks who felt like they were qualified to take part in exhibits or, you know, people have a lot of um, uncertainty and, and, um, and uh, you know, fears around, you know, what they're qualified to do. And this was a good way to kind of pull that down a little bit and demonstrate that, um, you know, if you have the interest, you can get the knowledge and be totally qualified to, to talk about this work and to display it. Um, so this is when we've actually talked about doing a, another version of it mm -hmm. as well. Um, but it was a good one for sure. Yeah. I'd like think... to add, oh, but just ahead. to add that, uh, it, <laughs> that we're, we're not like this objective space is that, but no. that we are also in, we're involved politically. We're engaged in in organizing ourselves. So I think like using using the collection and our exhibition space to present the kinds of work and propaganda that we ourselves make was yes. was a, is definitely a motivation of, of this exhibition. It's the motivation of of using utilizing the space to have the propaganda parties where where we are actually printing and distributing materials for for a particular political issue at the time that's relevant if it was you know the the movement for black lives or if it's climate justice it's mm. yeah it, it's like we are archiving our own our own histories and making our own histories so yeah i'm yeah. just going through other images as we talk to give people mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think um a big part of it um is by kind of claiming this space as um a movement space it's one more way in which we're you know, trying to um, push back against the notion of the archive as being, um, like Kevin saying, objective or neutral somehow, which is an ongoing kind of struggle yeah. to unlearn that from the profession and and kind of tease it out and and move in the other direction. I would say that, you know, I think that's something that a lot of archivists these days would um, agree with that the archive is not a neutral space whatsoever, even even if it's claiming to be. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what I that's what I was just going to bring up as well. We're in a moment right now, especially when we're rethinking, um, maybe bias is the right word, or maybe mm -hmm. um, you know where our institutions like museums, archives, libraries, how those collections are shaped and they're shaped by people and people are you know while interference archive may put their your politics up front institutions have politics because people have politics and there's no separating the people and the politics from these these institutions and how those shape the collections uh and i and you know that's that's true for everywhere mm -hmm. yeah absolutely uh, and I think part of that is also um, transitioning as we're talking about what's going on now. These are some materials you had pulled out to highlight, Sophie, around um, especially urgent social justice movements that are going on right now around decarceration and police brutality and thinking about kind of the role of the archive as a source of mutual aid, as a resource, as a, I, I keep saying active space, but I think that mm -hmm is really the best way to say it because in a lot of ways I think thinking of the archive as an active space works against the kind of notion we may have in our heads of what an archive is. So these are just some other examples from the collection. I don't know if you guys wanted to talk a little bit about what you're doing right now in these moments uh, to think about the current issues and how to respond to them as an archive but also as a space of mutual aid. Yeah, um, I think I can really briefly um, talk about our effort to do some digital collecting around the Black Lives Matter and George Floyd protests last summer. Um, I have some of those too, I can skip ahead. I was also going to show, I also have some images from your online exhibition that kind of traces the right. history of the protest movement. So these are from the online exhibition that you guys just put together about, uh, you know, instant educational protest movements in schools, so that kind of activism. And these are some more 
historic examples, and then a little bit more current ones, thinking about digital uh, archiving, and then uh, the link you shared with us in advance of your catalog efforts to archive Instagram posts, actually. So that's kind of a larger, a big opening, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, this, so this was the first time we've done active collecting, um, and we, um, I mean, it's, it's still such an ongoing conversation and such a big conversation, as you just said, that um, I'm only going to kind of try and scrape yeah. the surface just barely, because I know we're, we're hitting our time. But um, basically what this boiled down to was we had a couple of volunteers approach us asking if we were doing any collecting. Um, this would have been last summer. And, um, you know, it was, as most people can probably remember, it was a very particular moment of just this explosion on social media of this kind of graphic organizing. Um, we were all stuck inside, you know, COVID was really raging, um, but people were in the streets, you know, uh, we had all of these horrific examples of police brutality and, and state violence. Um, and, it felt important to at least talk about how we could maybe collect some of this. And that led to a conversation that I think is, has already been a part of Interference's mission, which is that we don't want to be an institution that is swooping in and, um, you know, siphoning content out of these movements um, without having a relationship with them, without asking permission. Um, there was one really egregious example with the Whitney um, acquiring artworks that artists had put up for auction to raise money for these movements and for these like for bail funds and stuff like that. But they didn't tell anyone that they were purchasing them for the museum and then tried to exhibit them. So they popped, you know, they purchased them at a cut rate. It was a it was a fundraiser rate um, and then decided that they were going to put together an exhibit of protest art. Um, and there was a lot of really justifiable backlash. I think that's a really great example of the model we're really trying to avoid, um, where we run the risk of organizers not feeling safe with us. We, we are a part of the movement community. Um, our volunteers are involved in these movements. Um, it's really important to us that we do this in cooperation with the people who are creating the work. But it's all an experiment. Like I said, we, we're not an actively collecting institution. We rely on donations. So um, this, was, this was very new and um, it involved a lot of conversation around ethics. And yeah, I was um, gonna say, thinking about notions of how to uh, have an ethical archive, ethical archiving as a practice. Uh, right archiving that is uh, community driven. We've talked about community a lot, but is done together with the community rather than on behalf of the community. I think uh, mm -hmm. this example is a good example of uh, trying to do something that you think is going to be for a certain group, but without actually being in conversation with that group. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you assume um, you know what they're going to say, then you're already in trouble. <laughs> Um, and, especially, and to, no, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, especially if you're an institution of any significant size and, and resources, you know, then, then, you know. Yeah, yeah. thinking back of uh, the building, the, the housing exhibition and having the opportunity for people to come in and see themselves in the show is just another way in which this kind of ethical archiving reminds you constantly that these aren't just materials. They're not right. just Instagram posts. They're not just pieces of paper. They're not just posters. They represent a person who has made this with a specific cause and agenda that's often very urgent and in sometimes life-threatening for them. So right. people's lives are really... Uh, tied up with these materials in a way that requires a different kind of thinking about what happens when they enter the archive. Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't know if we still have, we have Kevin somewhere, um, right? Hi. Did you, have Kevin? If you wanted to, I feel like looking at the time, we're kind of transitioning towards the Q&A. Malvika, you can let us know if that's right. But if there's anything else you wanted to add on these um, sort of especially urgent kind of collecting initiatives and current collecting initiatives or uh, ethical archiving at all? 
Maybe Sophie uh, said it all amazingly already. Maybe Sophie said it all. I did. I did, I did lose connection for some, for a oh. moment, but I just I would just say that um, yeah, it is. It's it's complicated to collect stuff that's currently happening. I mean, mm. it, even though with like a, a large volunteer base with very little capital, I mean, we don't we've never purchased things that, or the archive as an organization has never purchased anything for the collection, but. Um, yeah, I think it's it's just uh, it's it's difficult to to send people out to every protest and 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 bring stuff back. So it's like we rely on the on the donations of of people who have saved stuff in their homes or who remember to to collect flyers and, and drop them by. Yeah, I think the one last point I would love to hear a little bit about from either of you is especially this notion of mutual aid. This language uh, really entered my vernacular in the past couple of years, and I read it a lot on your website and your descriptions, and I was really curious to think about the archive as a space for mutual aid uh, in a really specific way. Well, I, I'd say the inception of it is was a result of mutual aid. I mean, the when Derek Greenwald was diagnosed with cancer, it was it was a network of of people in in our creative community and and just our 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 national international network that that came together to support her financially and and physically and so you know we had we had a care group that would bring that would bring her food that would also that raise money to to pay her for her medical bills and stuff and this is before you know you had like you know me. all these all these fundraising platforms it, it was just pretty much us sending around a link for people to send paypal to so yeah it, it's it was created from a, a literal mutual aid campaign and mm. i think that that the, the idea of of solidarity between social movements between different political struggles between different organizations it's mutually beneficial for us to have interse like an intersectional Mm. like philosophy because that is that is what it's going to get us to advance into like a, a more progressive society yeah and I'll, I'll just add that i think um you know interference only survives because of a network of people who've donated their money and labor um mm. and the reason we exist is to uh provide services to those same people but also as we've said, anyone who um, who comes in, and um, you know, I think a lot about how often in organizing, there's this sense of there are so many different things that need to happen. There's so many different jobs. There's so many different skills and and needs, and um, the archive interference is just one of many. Um, and I I do think of the archive as being part of um, that ecosystem of, of movement work. Um, and that, you know, in terms of the material too, having so many different movements in one space and giving, giving people the chance to see the overlap and the connections between those movements really fosters solidarity. Um, and, you know, we, um, there, yeah, our, when it comes to our scope of collecting, there isn't a movement will turn away. You know, it, we don't have a particular focus in that sense. Um, yeah, I, I guess, uh, you know, mutual aid is such a tricky term these days. I think people throw it around in a way that isn't always as accurate, um, but that at least I think for us as a, an organization helps push us a little bit to make sure that we actually are practicing mutual aid when we can um, and that it's not a one-way street that we are as much of the part of this community um, as we can be. Yeah I love that image uh, especially based on the way you've described how your materials are organized in the physical space of the mm -hmm. art. I love that image of materials from different movements touching each other in the space of the archive and in that way creating a sort of solidarity between them. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So I think I'll uh, stop the screen share, Malvika, if you want to. Does that work for you to lead us into a, a little yeah, Q&A? That's brilliant. That's so, so good. Uh, thank you so much, Megan. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Sophie. 
Thank you everyone in the chat who's turned out. Um, this has been a phenomenal conversation, by the way. Uh, Kevin, I love so much what you opened us up on about the ethos and ethical foundation of the 90s and kind of DIY being the creation of our own spaces and that those bookshops, those anarchist spaces become, you know, in terms spaces of political education, community spaces. And while this conversation has been ongoing, I've been thinking so much about how malleable that space is, how each person brings to it their own set of uh, practices and background, but also how, you know, in a way that space is expanded onto like Zoom. Um, and in a strange way, how we're returning to that time with, uh, you know, living in interesting times. Um, we have a bunch of questions that have just come in, that have come in throughout the conversation. I think in the interest of time, maybe we'll go through them kind of quickly uh, over the next 10 minutes or so, but I'd like to first pass the mic to Mariah who has been here um, and will share a few words about uh, her experiences intersecting with interference. Hey everyone, um, I'm just on audio only um, because I am coming to you from a workroom at a public library um, in the Midwest. And um, Malvika, thank you so much for um, yeah, passing the mic to me. I had realized that I just mainly had a comment more than a question. Um, but uh, I just wanted to um, mention that um, I know I'm one of the Interference Archive members who um, find membership really valuable, even though I don't live in New York. Um, I live in Chicago these days. I'm a public librarian, and so the work that Interference Archive does resonates with me um, a lot in terms of trying to break down barriers and focusing on doing things with people and co-creating rather than like a paternalistic doing things like for people. Um, and then Interference Archive has actually been really um, valuable and um, uh, I guess the word inspirational is kind of cheesy, but valuable and like it sparked a lot of things for me in terms of my own work. Um, I previously worked in Ann Arbor, Michigan um, where SDS was founded and had a lot of different you know, I'm like a former punk kid, so had a lot of different activist friends. Um, and uh, we have the Labadee collection there at the University of Michigan, which some of you are probably familiar with. It's a very different conception of an archive, um, also very necessary, but much more academic. Um, and they archive a lot of different radical social movements, um, but are much more of sort of a traditional archive. So when I I've been in there and it's a really wonderful collection, but things definitely do not feel as accessible as they do when you can just walk into Interference. Um, but uh, Interference Archive also kind of inspired um, some letterpress, we already were doing letterpress workshops at my library that I um, helped with. And uh, so we started doing uh, or designing a protest imminent poster printing program. Um, with letterpress and in order to inspire some of our participants, we actually ordered copies of Finally Got the News, um, which actually has a blurb um, from one of my activist friends in Ann Arbor um, promoting it. Um, and then we're able to tie into talking about the League of Revolutionary Black Workers and the Dodge Strike in Detroit um, and just sort of kind of able to bring things full circle to help people create their own protest media and, um, you know, not only protest media, but other media um, within the context of a public library. So I'm super thankful for all of the approach and ideas that Interference has given me over the last couple of years. Wow. Wow. Uh, Mariah, thank you so much for sharing um, all of that. And without further ado, we'll get uh, right into more of the questions. But, you know, to the three of you, please feel free to jump in at any moment um, if you want to reply, respond to anything. Uh, our next question will come from GE Schwartz in the chat. GE, you should be able to turn on your microphone. Thank you so much. And thank you, Malvika and BR for doing this again. Uh, this is one of those rare ones that, that I think we really, 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 really need. Many years ago in Troy, New York, I was involved in a place called Last Exit. At that point, it was also an archive place. It was also a meeting place, a conjunction of performances and all kinds of things. Um, and it was it was free literature. The literature was was well taken care of on shelves, the whole thing. But so my, my question overall, though, then is, 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 you know, because music, especially punk and radical free jazz, which which in the early 90s were like one, especially then, and then have been since then. Um, 
and uh, as and, and and also uh, with anarchist folk and other things in, to- in poetry, has there been such an integral part of the anarchist culture? Is audio visual material housed at the in- interference? And oh, thank you. I saw a little monitor later on after I'd asked my question that looked like it was, and then also. Does it, do you include uh, performances, ongoing things? You talk about the propaganda parties, but maybe something around those kind of things. Or to, you know, maybe people that have been involved in creating those, 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 um, those, um, those pieces that would maybe come and do talks and other things like that. Anyway, but thank you and uh, keep it up. Thank you so much. And also keep intersecting with other archives like yours, because I know there's others out there on various levels and refine them. Thank you. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that for sure. I mean, I'm sure Kevin can as well. Um, We have had such a wide swath of events over the years, and a lot of them have been people. um, So the first thing that popped into my head was Bev Grant, who's uh, the folk singer and and activist. Um, She has been very involved at Interference. She's done a number of performances, presentations. She's um, done lectures on her photography and, and on her music. She has also donated a whole lot of material. We have a really large vinyl collection at Interference too. I forgot to mention that. Um, and uh, people are welcome to come and listen to the records and, and do the whole thing. Um, so yeah, I think um, a big part of that we haven't, re- we talked about the exhibits, but we didn't talk about our other programming, which is often like as diverse as the people who are coming through the space because um we try you know we have events that um volunteers uh organize or that are connected to exhibits but we also try to make ourselves available as an event space for people doing work right now um whether that's performance uh lecture um skill shares the propaganda parties are a great example outside organizations will come to us for help with creating um, protest material. So um, yes, that's a, that's a big part of, especially you know, over the last year and a half, we haven't been able to do that. And it's really, I've felt the loss very, very acutely. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for that answer. Um, And I think that sets us up so beautifully for our next question, which will come from Lynn Crawford uh, in the audience and also in Detroit. Lynn, take it away. Thank you. This is so great, (laughs) y'all. I'm just hanging in your every word. Um, Yeah, Detroit, the, you know, home of the Detroit Print Cooperative and Freddie Perlman, and we've got a real rich history of that here. One of the things I was curious to ask about is, um, do you ever include poetics, fiction, poetry, um, creative work in your collections? Yes. <laughs> um, yes. We do have, we, we have publications. We, and uh, as far as events go, we have had poetry readings and other performances in the space. Um, I guess, well, yeah, Sophie, what do you want to add to that? I meant like bound volumes of of creative of creative work. And I guess the reason I'm asking is what's so awesome about what you're doing is that it it's this dissemination of of information and of knowledge and of arts which sometimes can be kind of regional so when you can you know put it out there and I just I happen to hear this is really short but the editor of a really great small press talk and I said boy it's too bad there aren't bookstores anymore where people could browse and discover things because that was a big way a lot of us discovered anything was just spending time in a bookstore and he said well I don't have to because I publish them and I'm like yeah that's the problem (laughs) how do the rest of us get it so it sounds like you have such a network it's impressive so anyway go ahead oh yeah we um we do have some bound um some prose some um poetry for sure um I think actually one of the collections or one of the areas in our collection that is richest with that kind of work is the zine collection. Um, You know, our library collection isn't necessarily super heavy on fiction. Um, There's a little bit of poetry in there, a little bit of prose, but I would say actually the the richest area is in the zine collection when it comes to um, creative written work. Um, And some of it is really 
really wonderful. And because they're zines, you know, they're these little gem kind of one of a kind, uh, you know, technically not one of a kind, they're photocopied, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's a really great one. Thank you. So deeply, thank you. Um, our next question will come from our very own Nick Bennett. And Nick, you should be able to turn on your microphone. Um, thank you so much, Megan and Sophie. Kevin, this has been a really, really wonderful conversation. And I'm glad that we can um, put aside this time to talk about archives because it's really important. Um, my question, I, I was sort of formulating it towards the beginning of the conversation, but you were talking about, um, of course, accessibility and some of the, dif the difficulties that that brings about. And I'm curious, um, how, how do you see such a democratic approach to archives changing or adjusting to a collection that grows over time? And that sort of connects to um, how would you all in a sort of ideal way envision institutions or larger archives incorporating this sort of commitment to accessibility? And that question may mean that maybe they are very separate and, and don't uh, maybe connect to each other, but I'm curious, um, you know, maybe what's your ideal for that? I can answer part of that. And I think it, it connects to the comment that we heard from the librarian earlier. Um, places like the, the Labity collection and Tamament at the NY, at NYU, we actually have volunteers that have worked at these spaces and we have connections to them. So there is, Again, there's there's also mutual aid between them because like when they're get when they might be removing stuff from their 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 collection, they actually will send it to us. So there is like mutual support between them between us, even though like we definitely pride ourselves on a you know a non non hierarchical organization and a counter institution. We also do appreciate places like like the Labity and all and and more. Um, university collections because they can they can preserve those things they can they have the ability and resources to make sure those items stay in perfect condition for per, in perpetuity <clears throat> excuse me in perpetuity and uh, and we can continue on as as our uh, as a ragtag you know volunteer supported collection that that tries to put on you know really really amazing exhibitions and programming but um i would say for for me i think like that 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 it's mutually beneficial to have both of those things and i think i'd let sophie speak to maybe how like the the ethics and of of collecting might might impact uh, those more conventional institutions yeah i think um i think sometimes people have this assumption that um it's all or nothing that we that we think because we're open access, we think everyone should be open stacks. Um, and obviously that's not as uh, realistic when it comes to truly like rare, fragile, one of a kind objects that we wanna preserve. I'm sorry for the siren. Um, but I think um, what I have noticed over the years is um, on an individual level, I think there is starting to be a little bit of a sea change within the profession and within the bigger research institutions um, about the ethics around access, around what access actually means, around um, the role of the archive in society um, and the power it can wield. Um, I also think that there is definitely a, a bit of a sea change around um, donor relations um, community archives is now like the uh, conversation of choice in archivist professional circles. Um, you've got institutions like the Mellon Foundation um, giving out large amounts of money specifically to community archives, meaning that they're giving them to um, organizations that are community run that wanna preserve their own material and don't wanna hand it over to a big institution. Um, and need the resources and the training to do that. So I, I, even just from between the time that I graduated and now, so even just 2016 to now, I think there has begun to be um, a more widespread reckoning um, that 
I think was happening prior to that as well. You know, the the in the within the field, people have been having these kinds of conversations for a long time. But that interference is um, obviously a part of that conversation, especially because it's in New York. <laughs> um, it is hooked into all of these different movement communities, but that it also is now attracting a lot of library science and archives students. Um, and so they're coming into the space, getting a totally different perspective on what an archive can be and what their work can be from what they're maybe getting in their program and then taking that with them into their careers. So I think interference has planted a lot of seeds in a lot of people's minds who have then gone on to work at those big institutions. So there is, there's a lot of change going on. Thank you so much, Sophie, uh, Kevin, all for, for that really dynamic answer. Um, I'm gonna ask a question of my own. Uh, in this conversation and also throughout the pre-check, I've been thinking so much about affirmative boundaries versus sort of negative boundaries, especially with everything you were saying, Sophie, about you know, how there's an expectation in archival and conservation traditions of you know, if you don't enforce the rules, if you don't gatekeep, if you don't you know, enforce the gloves and the thing that people won't respect the materials and how you're you know, pleasantly surprised to find that that's not the case. Uh, my question is that it seems like there's an ethical through line in this project of, you know, moving forward, uh, moving forward, projecting for the world you do want to live in, projecting for the things that you do want to happen rather than like the projecting for protecting against the things, the negative things we would like to safeguard against. And I think this really maps onto a kind of interpersonal way that people have been thinking about kind of boundary keeping and existing in, in society together. Uh, in the last year or so. And I guess my question is, um, how do we, you know, what are other ways that we project forward since this has been so successful? Uh, you know, how do we project kind of affirmative boundaries forward? How, what are other ways, other ways of kind of, what does it look like in each of your lives uh, and in your practices uh, when we produce into the world uh, for the thing that we do want to happen? How does that kind of shift and realign us? And this is a question for you, Megan, as well. I think of all three of you as people who've built careers in kind of alternative engagement, alternative community uh, action. Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um. Yeah, if you have a thought, Megan, go ahead. I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure if this is really the direction you, you had in mind for the question, but I think, um, I think about, you know, time being backwards and forward. So archive being connected to history, mm -hmm. history being the past, but archives also being connected to the future because the present also shapes the past and shapes the future through that. So I think um, in a way, building structures and uplifting voices that we want to see in this future is a way of projecting forward by looking backward, if, if that makes sense. So I think in that kind of collecting strategies, uh, in the artists that I write about in my criticism, in the um, support of certain publishing initiatives. Uh, these are ways in which we take structures that are part of history in a very specific way, you know, the book, the archive, but we project forward into a future that allows us to look back more accurately at the present, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, I think for me, um, you know, I, 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 want to be able to share something specific, but that's the most difficult part of this question, right? Is like, what actual actions can we take here? But for me, I think over the last couple of years, um, what has, I mean, what, what my, my political education at Interference was um, very meaningful. And like Kevin was saying early on, learning about things that um, I, wasn't going to learn anywhere else. Um, and I think in particular, the sort of anarchist values um, and organizing principles have been the most um, impactful on me. And in particular, 
this notion of um, anarchism as being potentially the most um, optimistic and ideals driven um, movement, you know, organizing the political philosophy and, um, and solidarity in particular as being um, a little bit of a guide star, I think for me, is that if you can continue to reorient yourself in a way that you're, you're asking yourself, okay, am I, am I taking care of my neighbors? Am I taking care of my friends? Am I taking care of my family and my community? Um, then I can, that is a sort of a more positively driven, like you're saying, Malvika, rather than like, okay, what do I have to guard against? Who do I need to reject? Who do I need to protect myself from? Um, and instead lean into uh, who can I um, show solidarity to? Who can I um, work with and understand better? And that is certainly uh, something that interference is very good at helping people do, I think, is, is making those connections and um, seeing the possibility. I don't think I have anything too profound to say, except for like, just to try and, I mean, th considering a slogan of just like being the change you want to see. And the way that we've structured interference and the way it practices, it's as our as ourselves individually and as an organization it, it is it's just an attempt to to manifest something to manifest our, our principles and our social relations in the way that that to the the way that we possibly can or just the way that we can be the best that we can and and there's so much there's so much internal dialogue between the volunteers of of even considering like what is it for people to be able to volunteer and access the space there's a lot of there's a lot of internal critique that happens and i think yeah just the the nature of a non-hierarchical non-hierarchical and volunteer-based organization that's been able to persevere for now for 10 years which is it, it feels really amazing um i guess it's just yeah that's we we're trying to manifest like the the, the best part of our, our practices and principles and in, in our philosophies. Kevin, thank you so much for those answers. I know, um, you know, at the rail, we're very invested in kind of love and community wisdom. Um, so this is really resonating with so much of our mission. I'd love to pass the mic now to our publisher and the captain of this fine ship, Fong Bui. Fong, you should be able to turn on your microphone. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Megan. And I can say this in answering, help to answer in both Nick and Malvika's question. No affirmative action, no community, no spoon feeding, no explanation. That's what art is about. You don't need a mission statement. The rail doesn't have a mission statement. Can you walk up the stair back and down, forward and down without a need to rest your hand on the handrail? If you're not in that space, you shouldn't feel to be in it for all of us. So I admire what you do because it reflects exactly what the rail is doing. We're not interested in arriving. We're interested in the journey. That's what makes the journey is not a trip. Why are you in the journey? You should embrace it. Our friend Susan Howe, the great poet, once said that words are spirit and <laughs> paper is skin. So the archive is exactly the body trace of the two. The archive is the body trace of spirit in the world and paper the skin. You know, recently, I don't know who was I talking to, maybe Terence Simon, the, the artist who said that archive exists because there's something cannot be said easily articulated in any form and shape because it is say in that gap of all the information. That's what archive is so important. Uh, and, you know, in a way, the reason why the rail does what it does, just similar to your own living organism, we're not in institution. We have to make that clear. We're not in institution. <laughs> we are living organism. We grow. And we put experiment before ease and art before comment. No artist I know of, no poet you know of, all of us know, have a mission statement. 
our, our mission statement is anti mission statement and do not surrender to easy technical invention of any words and any term by anybody. We had to invite, invent ourselves. That's the whole idea, you know? Um, you know, look, <laughs> in 93 or something, I bought an archive uh, of seven or that's only exists one year, 1916, 1917, and it, it touches me. Seven arts. It changes my whole life. It allowed me to be able to talk with the seven art or the great publisher I admire, the editor. You know, the reason why we do what we do best, just like the artists, because we can afford to do so, because the rule, what we do, we don't really expect to make money. That's a very important thing to keep in mind. That's why we do reflect the artist. No artist, no poet, writer, write expecting to have a real cushion lifestyle. You can get a PhD in teaching at the academy, that's fine, you know? But to do what we do, we must trust that negative capability, what John Kidd say. So it's important to pay attention in the making, in the process, and that's what you guys do so beautifully. So I'm grateful to have more friends, you know, colleagues, of like-minded because we need to come together like this to amplify the power of anxiety and productive to create a confidence through the act, not the solution, not looking towards the result of any kind, not surrender to all of that. So forget about the future, forget about everything. Right now is what's important right here. It's it, that, that bodily trace that tie us together. So thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you for our beloved Megan, because she's really know how to moderate all this incredible, fragile, but powerful conversation. Thank you so much. Return to you, Marvika. Thank you, Fong. Uh, so it's our tradition at the rail to end with a poetry reading. And today I'm so excited to be welcoming Brooklyn-based poet, Chariot Wish who spent a day in the archives this past weekend and will be sharing an ekphrastic, archives-inspired original piece they've written. Uh, I'll read their bio right now. Chariot Wish's work has appeared in the Quarterless Review, Yes Poetry and Shit Wonder, uh, which comes through our friend Ben Fama, I believe. Their chapbook titled A New Heaven and a New Earth will be out this fall shortly from Wonder Press. Chariot, I'm so, so excited to be handing you the mic. Take it away. Hi, can everyone hear me? Is this good? Hi. Um, well, first, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much. Um, and it's really, yeah, but an honor to be um, invited um, into this event and into the archive. And it's really incredible listening to everybody speak um, because, yeah, it was explained pretty much exactly like my experience in going into the archive. It was my first time there. And I was so just comforted and amazed by, um, yeah, well, first of all, I mean, by the collection and um, yeah, the ability to just like touch, like touch these objects, um, you know, without the white gloves and, and everything that was together. And, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm an anarchist. Um, I have an info shop to me, anarchy is so much about tradition. Um, and being able to, yeah, see like the lineage and like of these traditions and these multiple social traditions and um, just how much is like passed on through our elders and through time. Um, and yeah, in the way too, I'm someone was speaking about how all these things are situated together within the archive. So, um, and yeah, going into it, you know, I was going in as an anarchist, um, as like a queer transgender person and also recently very interested in the May 68 um, student riots. So that's that's what I was like pulling from when I was there. Um, and yeah, oh yeah, and I guess I'll say too, yeah, as an anarchist, um, my idea is, you know, it is half tradition, half action. Um, and yeah, so this this poem is coming from, from these places. Um, and it's called The Complete Destruction of Our Present Conditions. Your asshole, like a garden in May, silver lined and red, always a halo. Love slopes from the moon 
etc., etc. The eternal skirts by. It's always this word passed on. In waiting, one learns to wait. In action, one learns to act. To live without dead time, to come without fetters. If you have wings, you have teeth, like a string of robberies on a necklace like pearls. America is dead, and God asked, do you want to burn the market, then fist me? Shining in our piss is human desire and life itself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harriet. Uh, love those two projects combined. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you, Megan, Sophie, Kevin, who just had to leave because it is a harvest day up on his farm and all the friends at Interference Archive who've dropped by together. This has been such a wonderful example of cultural generosity, exactly what Fong articulated. And I think a good touch point as we think of our own program as an archive of the present times. Uh, we'll be uploading the recording of this conversation to the event archives online as well as to YouTube. So it will be available in a few days if ever you'd like to revisit this vital space. If you'd like to stay up to date with Interference Archive, join their mailing list at this link I've just dropped. I'll drop it again. Uh, they're also accepting donations of both financial contributions but also material aid, which I find very uh, lovely. Um, so that's everything from archival and conservation materials uh, to first aid kits, office supplies to your skills, your time, your friendship. Uh, just drop those freshly, uh, hit that up. We do this every day here at The Rail. We have a program daily, so please join us again tomorrow for the Forever Museum Archive, circa 6000 BCE, when we'll be joined by artist Anya Dika Chuke and curator Gabriel Florence in conversation with writer Leanne Norman. This is an event that emerges out of Onyedika Chuke's uh, exhibition, The Forever Museum Archive, which is co-presented by the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council and Pioneer Works. It's on view in Governor's Island through uh, Halloween of this year. Spooky. We'll close again uh, with a necrastic poem read and written by I.S. Jones, a poet and music journalist, also inspired by her time in the exhibition. And that will be, as always, at 1 p.m right here in the Zoom. But other than that, thank you all so much for tuning in. I'll invite you to turn on your microphones now if you'd like to say hello to one another, goodbye as you exit, or uh, anything else that compels you. But this has been so amazing. Thank you, uh, especially to Megan for being such a beautiful captain and navigator, um, to Sophie, to you know Kevin, to everyone. This has been great. Thank you, thank you. It was great. It was fun. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. You made Igor. me laugh. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank Megan. you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Thanks for that great reading, Chariot. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chariot. Thank you, Chariot. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you.